Welcome to On the Other Hand. In Matthew chapter 24 it says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. I've always wondered, how can the elect be deceived? How can those who seem to have the most solid relationship with Christ fall away to walk a different path? For a while, I honestly didn't think that could or would happen, at least not anyone I knew. Then it did. A relative and their family left the faith, then a mission companion, then a friend. I'm not trying to say there's a widespread exodus of faith right now, but it can sometimes feel that way when someone you look up to for their faith walks away. It's hard, and it hurts. As I've pondered on this subject, I've noticed that many people who leave their faith nowadays do so either in the name of inherently political reasons, or they seem to replace their religious faith with political activism shortly after. The first thing that I've been pondering comes from this fair talk about what a worldview is and how it is a guiding principle in our lives, but often is unseen and can differ from what we say our guiding principle is. Let's imagine two roommates, James and Greg, who both attend BYU. Um, they live under the same roof. They are both practicing Latter-day Saints, and they both claim to believe the doctrines taught in, by the Proclamation on the Family on Sexuality and Gender. However, despite their shared beliefs, the way they experience church culture and policies couldn't be more different. For James, BYU's honor code seems like a natural extension of those teachings, an institutional scaffold that helps reinforce our moral intuitions. For him, discipleship involves participating in a community that encourages and reinforces our shared values and priorities and helps us maintain our ideals and live out our convictions. For Greg, the community norms these doctrines give rise to are disclosed to him and experienced by him as stifling and burdensome towards LGBT individuals. He concludes that his faith requires him to engage in political and social advocacy on the behalf of LGBT friends, families, and neighbors to make the university and the church more hospitable for those who live LGBT lifestyles. This leads us to the question, how can two people who share the same doctrinal beliefs arrive at such wildly different conclusions? This question is relevant to those of us who want to help members maintain faith and conviction. The Gregs of the story do not always experience a crisis of faith and leave the church. But Greg's approach may indeed prime him towards distrust of the church's policies and traditions, and sow the seeds of continued disappointment and future disaffection when the church doesn't change in the ways he prefers. I believe the answer to this question is that doctrinal propositions are not always the primary source of our most central convictions. More often than not, our convictions form as a result of our worldviews. Wilkins and Sanford argue that our stated beliefs, that is, our um, confessional beliefs are, can be at odds with our convictional beliefs. Confessional beliefs are those doctrinal commitments that we profess to hold to, and our convictional beliefs are those values that are reflected in how we live our lives. Our questions and discourse can often be informed by hidden worldviews that sneak into our thinking and shape our convictions. It is not the worldviews that begin as theories or intellectual systems that mold the lives and beliefs of most people. Instead, the most powerful influences come from worldviews that emerge from culture. They are all around us, but are so deeply embedded in our culture that we don't see them. In other words, these worldviews are hidden in plain sight. We are more likely to absorb them from cultural contact than through rational evaluation of competing theories. Because of their stealthy nature, these worldviews find their way behind church doors, mixed in with Christian ideas, and sometimes identified with Christian positions. In a similar way, I believe that Latter-day Saints today, many Latter-day Saints today struggle with their faith not because they've learned something about, well, something about what Brigham Young said or did, or because they discovered some nasty facts surrounding polygamy, or some eccentricities of Book of Mormon, Book of Mormon translation, etc. Many of people think that their, their trials of faith center on these questions, and some of them may be right. But it seems to me that many of those who struggle with these historical questions do so because they first embraced unquestioningly, and often unwittingly, other worldviews, and other worldviews with stories that tilt them towards doubt. Having done so, Historical questions provide a pretext for a faith crisis that has been the works long before they ever realized. And the true reasons for their crisis are often beyond their ability to articulate. They are merely living out a story handed to them by their worldview. We don't often have a shared language for talking about these competing worldviews. 
Let me share a story that is told by a graphic designer named Robin Williams. Many years ago, I received a tree identification book for Christmas. I was at my parents' home, and after all the gifts had been opened, I decided to go out and identify the trees in the neighborhood. Before I went out, I read through part of the book. The first tree in the book was the Joshua tree, because it took only two clues to identify it. Now, the Joshua tree is a really weird-looking tree. And I looked at that picture and said to myself, oh, we don't have that kind of tree in Northern California. That is a weird-looking tree. I would know if I saw that tree, and I've never seen one before. So I took my book and went outside. My parents lived on a cul-de-sac in a cul-de-sac of six homes. Four of those homes had Joshua trees in the front yard. I had lived in that house for 13 years, and I had never seen a Joshua tree. Once I was conscious of the tree, once I could name it, I saw it everywhere. This is what I call, sometimes call the Joshua tree principle. If we cannot name something, it is often invisible to us. And our own worldviews are often invisible to us precisely because we don't have names for them. And so by giving names to these worldviews and showcasing them with examples, we've done perhaps a third of the necessary work. We will have revealed to many something about their own thinking that they before did not fully notice or realize. For some, this unveiling and revealing might even be enough to show them the source of their difficulties and the path back into faith and conviction. For others, it might at least be a start on that journey. So our stated beliefs can be at odds with how we live our lives. And these beliefs that directly shape our worldview are so deeply embedded in our culture that we probably can't even see them. There's also a really good article on eight signs that your Christianity is too comfortable that was put out a couple years ago. And I find it telling that the first thing listed as a red flag is if there's absolutely no friction between your Christianity and your partisan politics. Then later, a faith that aligns perfectly with your political party is suspiciously convenient. I think this makes a lot of sense, because if your faith lines up perfectly with your political party or platform, there's a good chance that your politics are the most important building block of your worldview rather than your faith. And I'd also like to pull on this article from Square2, an online journal I recently stumbled across that focuses on submissions of feminist members of the church. In the article titled, Against the Politics of Salvation, Savannah Johnston says in part, The left has long bought into the politics of salvation, or the idea that humankind can be saved through political action. Man must dethrone God in pursuit of his own salvation. Indeed, this is the core belief underlying all leftist ideologies. Human nature is changeable, and man is the one to do it. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Man's hand, specifically. As a Christian, I believe that human nature is changeable and salvation is possible only through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Later, she continues, Partisans on the right do violence to the gospel by politicizing it, by trying to usher in the kingdom through their own political efforts. Moreover, by attaching Christ's name to political platform designed by men, the message of Christianity becomes muddled and confused in the scrum of political discourse. Here's the problem with the politics of salvation. If every policy is a matter of salvation or damnation, there can be no compromise. The other side truly is your enemy. We can't lower the temperature of American politics until we lower the stakes of politics. The best way to do that is to abandon the politics of salvation in favor of more moderate, measured expectation. Government will not and cannot provide salvation. I agree. It seems like many people either knowingly or unknowingly look to government and politics to be a religion nowadays, or a means to achieve salvation. And I think if people's priorities shift to have those agendas become the most important thing to them, they will leave their faith behind in order to support their new worldview. This principle is also displayed in the Book of Mormon, when a prophet named Lehi has a vision, and within that vision, a rod of iron leads to the tree of life. The iron rod represents the word of God, and the tree represents the love of God, or Christ and his gospel. In this vision, Lehi stands at the tree and calls to others to hold on to the rod and come to the tree and partake of the fruit, fruit that is pure, delicious, and can make one happy. And there are those who make their way to the tree, but there are also those who disregard the invitation and go some other way. Prominent in this vision is a great and spacious building, which is representative of the pride and wisdom of the world. Those in the great and spacious building mock and entice those at the tree, and convince many to be ashamed of eating the fruit. And those now ashamed people turn away and are lost in the mist of darkness, or make their way to the building to join the scoffing. Anyway, for this discussion, the main point I see is that for those who want what their faith has to offer, they make the tree and the fruit their ultimate goal and priority, and do everything that needs to be done to get there and to stay there. The problem is that there are those who are on their journey, or who have arrived, and start to look around and see other paths or destinations, such as the great and spacious building, and then slowly start to wish to be somewhere else besides the tree. 
their worldview, goals, and destinations slowly shift, and then they decide to leave. And when it comes to worldly pride and wisdom, politics currently presents itself as the answer to salvation to anyone who will vote or play activist for a given cause. Is it any wonder that the people who leave behind the direction and purpose faith provide wish for something to fill and provide a new purpose and direction, a bigger whole that they can commit their lives to? I've been sad to see people I love walk away from their faith that has provided them so much purpose and joy, and I wish them the best of luck finding their new ultimate purpose and goals to devote their life to. I just hope that they can know and name why they have moved away from their faith, instead of incorrectly concluding that it has been their faith that moved away from them. As always, thanks, hope you enjoyed. And if you did, consider subscribing or joining me on Odyssey, a great YouTube alternative. Link is in the description.